Hello and welcome to this morning's webinar. My name is Lem Bingley and I'm the editor of Construction News. Now today we are going to focus uh, on diversity of thought, the importance of ensuring that firms in construction can draw on a wealth of different viewpoints and life experiences, particularly when it comes to business decision making at the most senior levels. Uh, now obviously because of the current situation, everyone involved in this webinar this morning is working remotely. Uh, we're all at the mercy of our different internet connections, so please do bear with us if we have any technical difficulties today. If any of us are disconnected without warning, um, me included, we'll try to reconnect as quickly as possible. Uh, we are scheduled to run for about 45 minutes today and a recording will be available afterwards if you're not able to stay for the whole of the session. We'll also be taking questions towards the end of the webinar uh, and you should be able to see a Q&A button uh, on the control bar uh, in Teams today. Um, so please do submit questions as soon as they occur to you while, while the uh, discussion is going on uh, and we'll do our best to answer as many of those questions as possible. Today's webinar is part of our Inspiring Women programme, which aims to address the gender imbalance that exists in the construction industry. And we hope today's discussion will be of particular interest to women in our sector, but I hope it will also be useful to everyone watching, no matter what their background is. Um, as the theme of today's debate underscores, everyone uh, is equally welcome. I'd like to thank the sponsors of our campaign, um, headline sponsor in particular, Wilmot Dixon, uh, and the rest of our supporters as well. Um, they, they are Juice Marketing, NASC, Trad and Vanchi Construction. Now, um, we may be falling at the first hurdle when it comes to uh, diversity of thought because we have an all female panel, panel for you today. Uh, all women, all outstanding in their field. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome Gillian Charlesworth, the Chief Executive of the BRE Group, Lynn Way, the President of the National Access and Scaffolding Confederation, Caroline Sheridan, who is the Director of en uh, Engineering Delivery at Transport for London, and Helen Hare, the Director of Project Management at Great Portland Estates. Now I'm going to ask each of them to say a few words to introduce themselves. So Gillian, please, would you start please? Thank you. Hello, yes, good morning everybody and uh, thank you Lem. I'm delighted to take part in this panel session today. I, uh, as Lem has said, I'm Chief Executive of the BRE Group. I joined uh, BRE just over a year ago and before that I worked at uh, RICS for 15 years. So I've been working with the property and construction sector for quite a number of years now. And I must say, I think it's a, it's a great industry if it, if it uh, works for you. And I think that we've seen a lot of progress on this issue of diversity and inclusion, but um, nowhere near enough. So I, every time I'm asked to speak on this subject, I'd absolutely uh, take up that opportunity because I want to encourage other women uh, and people from a diverse range of backgrounds who are contemplating a career in the sector to feel that there are opportunities and that there are role models and people who can encourage um, you to, to make a success of it. Um, when I was thinking about what, what I wanted to say this morning, I thought very much about the evidence base for diverse uh, boards. This is not really anymore about fairness. This is now about uh, the business imperative of uh, diverse and inclusive boards. And I think there's a clear body of evidence that um, non-homogenous teams are smarter better at uh, assessing facts, making sound decisions, looking at risk, uh, and also being innovative um, and uh, working together in a constructive way with, with appropriate levels of challenge, but also great collaboration. So I think the evidence base is there. And what I'm looking forward to hearing about this morning is people's views on how we can take up the clear need a more diverse and inclusive sector and I'll just link this um, to the to the current crisis in a quote that uh, someone sent me this morning from McKinsey inclusion and diversity are at risk in the crisis 
but are crucial for business recovery, resilience and reimagination. So I think there is our mandate. Thank you, Lynn. Thanks, Gillian. Um, Lynn, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, um, I'm Lynn Way. I'm uh, the first female president for the NESC. Um, but little do people know, but I'm also the youngest ever female uh, ever president and also the first president to come from the southwest um, region. So it's a few firsts. Um, on, I feel diversity in, well, within my, my opinion, enhances the organisation. I think by having a wide range of opinions and mindsets um, encourages a more well-rounded solution system. Um, this would include not just people's ages, race, sexuality, but also coming from companies of any size. Um, I'm from a, a small company. Um, I'm the financial director and company secretary. Um, been in the uh, in the construction industry for since '96. So, and I love it. I do. If you told me when I was young and in school that I was going to work in the construction sector, I would have laughed in your face. But um, I do love it, and I would encourage anybody to come forward because um, it is a very good industry to work in. Um, and I think you can get a solid career in it, whichever way you want to go. There's such a, a wide range of uh, opportunities within the sectors that you can go in. Um, I do think I am. Um, I do want to encourage more women within the NESC. Um, we've been trying to do that by grassroots, going to the regional meetings, um, going to events, obviously, to encourage. But I think we are starting to, to starting to see a change and I hope it will develop forward. And thank you for inviting me to do this today. <laughs> uh, thanks, Lynn. Caroline, would you like to um, say a few words? Yes, good morning, everybody. And uh, thanks, Lem, and thanks very much for inviting me to be on this panel today. Um, so my name is Caroline Sheridan, and uh, when people ask me what I do, I always say I'm a chartered civil engineer because that is what I am and what I do. Um, my current role is director of TfL Engineering Delivery and uh, Transport for London. TfL is a hugely complex and diverse organisation, not only in its people, but in its remit. And uh, it has a massive interconnecting transport network that keeps London moving and creates such an opportunity to address some of the challenges around diversity um, that we have to bring in innovative solutions and um, a direction of travel that um, the construction industry and many other industries uh, need to take. So I've been an engineer for over 25 years and worked in construction in various sectors and a significant chunk of my time was at Heathrow in various, uh, various guises um, through terminal development and change uh, areas. And I moved to Transport for London uh, two and a half years ago and I think that's um, my journey through my career has exposed me to a lot of different views and a lot of different um, uh, thoughts and experiences. And I always think, um, for me personally, exposing myself to different environments and challenges and organisation allows you to see the challenges that we face for a number of lenses. And you can apply this, uh, this thinking to uh, diversity of thought. I think it's really important that we are all learning growing and operating out of our comfort zone and trying to understand the lens in which we see the world such that we can challenge that um, when we are working within teams and looking to reach for innovative solutions. I think personally I always watch out for that feeling that I know how to fix it and I should crack on and do it without checking and testing the opinion of others and the context in which I'm working in. And in terms of diversity of thought, what it really means to me, I think it's really important that uh, it exhibits and allows fairness, inclus inclusivity, creativity, 
and together inspires uh, the industry to meet the challenges in which we face. Thank you, Caroline. Um, Helen, if you would like to introduce yourself. I think you may still be muted. Thank you, Lem. Hopefully you can hear me now. Yes, we um, can. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Helen Hera, Great Poland to stay. Um, I have almost 30 years experience in property and construction. Um, and, I, and I just wanted to share a brief outline of, of my journey during those 30 years with you. Um, I chose to leave full-time education aged 18 to undertake a part-time degree in quantity surveying while working four days a week for a local quantity surveying practice, much to the despair of my grammar school heads, I might add. Five years later, I graduated with five years work experience under my belt and went on to complete my APC. By this time, I was working for one of the country's leading QS practices. Since then, I've worked across many disciplines with contractors, consultants, but mostly over the last 20 years in professional services on the client side. Currently, I'm Director of Project Management for Great Portland Estates. Great Portland Estates are a FTSE 250 central London property company with approximately £2.6 billion worth of assets. I hold full responsibility for procurement and delivery of all projects. And that's across our managed portfolio and development pipeline. And for us, inclusion and diversity is high on the agenda. But we are a small business with approximately 110 people. And so it does take time to make changes. Coming from a mixed race background, I've been exposed to several areas of diversity or rather lack of. From being bullied as a small child, judged for the male subject choices I made, to my senior school teachers suggesting I would never succeed unless I attended full time university. But that was their opinion and one that I never felt respected my views and feelings. After all, if we all felt the same, where would new opportunities develop? And you may be wondering why I've chosen to reflect on some examples from my younger years rather than the current workplace. And that is because I feel that we really should consider and be mindful of the age at which people can be influenced. Thank you. Lynn. Thank you very much, Helen. Um, we're going to move on to the first question now, um, which is uh, a topic that, that um, uh, a couple of you have touched on in your introductions. Uh, now, I know we have a predominantly female uh, audience listening to us live this morning. Um, uh, and one question I have is if, if people are looking at their own career development and wanting to become uh, a board member in the future, a senior decision maker, senior figure in the industry, do they have to take on male characteristics? Do they have to ape those people who are currently in the board in order to, to get there? Um, Helen, uh, you, you mentioned having to battle the perception that you were taking male um, subject choices. But what do you think about that that idea that you have to act like a man to succeed? Um, it's, it's, it's not one that is familiar to me, if I'm completely honest. Um, I think the approach that I've always taken to all of my choices is that be yourself. Um, you, you add interest and diversity to the conversation. Um, if, if we all exa acted exactly the same, we'd all think the same, we'd all produce the same results. Um, we're not going to create greater opportunities um, and diversity of thought if, if we all act exactly the same. Um, I, I actually went in the opposite direction by making male choices, but equally that was frowned upon. Um, I, I would always encourage anybody to, to be yourself in every scenario. Lynn, I think in your uh, introduction, you, you touched on the fact that you were not only the youngest person to hold the role that you're in, the, the first woman and, and, and the first person from your part of the country as well. Um, do you think that you've you've been able to uh, be yourself in in that journey, or have you do, have you ever had to take on uh, characteristics that you feel are not part of yourself to, in order to make progress? I think I actually made sure I was more myself um, because people could see I was genuine. 
and I really did. Um, one, I I made sure I knew what I was talking about before I opened my mouth and um, made sure I was forthcoming with the information. But the way I came across is no different to what I would do within my company. So I, I just, um, I have to back what Helen just said then, I would, I would be yourself. But uh, if you come across somebody who's coming a little bit differently towards you, then just step back, breathe there, and then just carry on being yourself. Don't try and get out of your, um, your comfort zone because you know what you're like within that within that area and then and the confidence will build more and more you go because when you first go to for example when I first went to site I found it um, quite daunting because it was a very male um, environment when I attended but I I shied away a bit when I first attended site I hardly spoke but the next time I went I made a point of of speaking you know of being me and yeah that's what i would i would recommend thank you now jillian um <coughs> women are un underrepresented uh throughout this industry i think they're particularly underrepresented amongst ceos uh what's mm -hmm. been your experience in in how you've had to um uh what have you had to do to to achieve the success you have in your career well, I, I would certainly endorse what Helen and Lynn have said. I think it is very much about being yourself because it is a terrible strain to try and be somebody you're not. Equally, I think that we should all um, consciously put ourselves, stretch ourselves on a regular basis and do things that are um, difficult because that is how you grow and how you grow in confidence. Um, and there are, I think for us all, you know, there'll be lots of things that we find quite quite challenging and quite difficult. One one issue which um, I think I think I suspect a lot of women struggle with, and there is there is evidence that this is true. Uh, and it may not just apply to women; it may apply to anybody who's it who. Uh, is in a minority in terms of their, their either their way of thinking or their characteristics on a board and that is that it's it is sometimes very frustrating when you feel you've made a point uh, and you don't feel listened to uh, and there's quite a again there's quite a body of evidence that um, sometimes the collected gathering if, if others are all of the same mind they don't hear you when you're speaking uh, in a different way or making a different point and then perhaps a while later somebody makes the same point and you think I've just made that point um, weren't they listening to me and I think it's at those moments that you realize that you are different and that you have to find techniques to make yourself heard um, I would not be an advocate of you know losing your temper and shouting at people at that point at all. I think that's you know it's very counterproductive to become um, to become shirty over these things. But I do think we have to find ways of just challenging the group think that we're surrounded by and finding ways to assert ourselves. So I think probably most people who know me would say that um, if they've been you know worked with me for a while will say something a little bit similar to what Lynn said you start off just uh, listening and making sure that you know what you're talking about but then you certainly get stuck in and assert yourself and sometimes you have to challenge the way other people are are behaving in in such groups thank you Jane. and, and um, Caroline what's your What's your view? What has been your experience on this topic? Yeah, so um, I, I uh, support everything that has been said, actually, and it's really important to be yourself. Uh, to be perfectly honest, I don't think I've always been myself. Um, and certainly in some environments have had to switch on probably what would be more stereotypically male characteristics uh, to be heard. And, you know, the reality is uh, I know in reflection that I wasn't at my best at that time. I wasn't certainly wasn't at my happiest. Um, and I've learned really over the time over time to really make sure I am being true to my values, true to myself and, and being myself. I think it makes um, 
I think people who uh, put effort in being themselves, they come across with much more sincerity, um, with really displaying what they believe and what they think and um, can help an honest conversation. So I, I would say I've certainly been in uh, the situation where I've adapted um, who I am to fit in and to be successful and to be seen to be successful. But I do really uh, believe the right thing to be is yourself. And also sort of back the, the, the fact that actually you, you need to be yourself, but you also need to be effective and you need to be heard. And um, adapting your style when you are in a group or when you are talking to a certain individual, understanding as much about them as you um, do about yourself so that you can adapt your style to be heard is really important. But you don't need to do that through um, sort of more aggressive um, techniques. So um, I would I would say I am certainly at my best and I see the best through others when they are, are being themselves. Thank you. Um, I'd like to move on to uh, a slightly different angle on, on the question to think about what what benefits um, companies can experience if they do encourage diversity of thought perhaps at every level, but perhaps also at the, at the sort of decision making, the senior uh, senior levels within the organisation. Uh, and I'm particularly interested in how that um, diversity of thought might relate to some of the pressing issues that uh, that we've seen in the industry, things like recruiting the right kind of people, retaining the top talent. Um, um, Gillian, I mean, uh, as the CEO of your organisation, what's your view on, on how diversity of thought influences those those key sort of biz, business issues that uh, companies face? Well, I certainly um, am a strong believer in the importance of diversity from my own experiences. But I think I think it's important also to look at the, the growing evidence that um, companies are finding quite simply more diversity of thought, ideas, um, different approaches on the board or and or executive team of a business will make it more successful, both in terms of the immediate challenge of profitability, but also in terms of creating long term value uh, for customers and shareholders. So I think I think the evidence is there. And to my mind, um, from what I've certainly from what I've read and experienced, it's it is down to, as I said in my introduction, down to uh, being more fact orientated and less opinion and group think orientated. Um, using facts to make decisions rather than opinions. I mean, opinions are important, but, you know, actually having a fact base for decisions, being able to analyse risk uh, by challenging each other on ideas. Um, and I certainly identify with uh, what I think Caroline said earlier, that it's actually a leaders. It's quite easy to leap to a conclusion because you're paid to be decisive and to lead and to have views. But actually sitting and listening to a range of opinions from people of different state career stages, uh, backgrounds, etc., I think is, is just crucial. I think the evidence is all there that um, this is this leads to greater business success. And I think given the challenges that we're facing now, not just the immediate coronavirus challenge, but generally a disrupted world, um, a revolution going on, really, this is all the more important. Businesses that are not thinking like this will be caught out. Thank you. Helen, what's your view? Uh, I don't know what your experience is at Great Portland Estates, whether, whether um, that company has a, um, a particularly diverse leadership or, or um, what your experience is of the advantages of, di of different viewpoints uh, in your career? Sure. Um, well, it's, it's a really interesting topic, Len, because um, as, as I mentioned, inclusion and diversity is high on the agenda for us and something that has had great focus, particularly over the last three or four years, um, to the point where we have, well, we believe we have a good level of diversity at board level. Um, I think we have um, something in the region of 38% of females on our board. Um, 
that does need to, we, we believe, improve into other areas of diversity too. Um, but one other area we've looked at is, is not just at board level, it's about bringing it down all the way through the business. So equally through our senior leadership team, we have around 47% of females on our senior leadership team now. And we feel that's really, really important because to make a difference throughout the entire business, it's important to have that diversity throughout and not just at the top. Um, I think just just touching on some of the points from earlier as well. Um, I, I think it's it's been. I mean, certainly for me, it's been really valuable to have a great level of engagement with some of the females on our on our board. Um, and uh, we've introduced um, all kinds of um, feedback and also engagement sessions. Um, you know, I've I've sat with some, two of our female non-execs. Um, I've had an intro call with the latest one that's joined us this year and just to get um, just that feedback from somebody else in terms of their own experience. Um, also bearing in mind that these people come from different backgrounds to me, you know, I, I'm, I'm more construction focused and property focused, but um, the, the other ladies on our board, they are from financial backgrounds. Um, one of our non-execs is involved in the NHS. So you, you're getting a real variety um, and, and, and views through the experiences that they have themselves. Um, we've also introduced um, something that I was, I was lucky enough to experience over the last uh, nine months, um, a, a programme where we're giving senior management the ability to sit on our exec comp for six months um, and again, we're trying to introduce diversity of thought there so that it's not just seniors um, introducing their thoughts only into that process. We're trying to bring people through to the business, but also give people the opportunity to develop in themselves um, and give them that confidence to be able to speak in those arenas, um, feel that they are being heard. And, and, and I can honestly say I've, I've sat at that table and I, I believe I have been listened to. Um, which has which been fantastic for my own growth and development. Thank you. Uh, Caroline, uh, Transport for London's a, <laughs> a huge organisation and um, uh, obviously I, I imagine retaining talent, attracting talent is, is a big uh, a big factor for an organisation of that scale. Um, what's, what's your view on, on how diversity of thought at the, at the higher levels can translate throughout the organisation into benefits? Yeah, and it, it is. It's an, an enormous organisation with a huge history and legacy, um, which is which is much celebrated, actually. But that doesn't mean to say that um, that it, we don't need to adapt and address some of the challenges that we have. I think I think one of the biggest challenges that we have is um, is that we need to drive this change and bring in much more inclusive, inclusivity and diversity. Whilst we don't necessarily have the representation of um, diversity across our, our boards or executives, and I think that is a is a real challenge that we face and um, you know, something that TfL takes uh, incredibly seriously. But I think we need to look at that um, in terms of actually what is what is my role and what is the, the roles of others from all backgrounds, um, all, all um, experiences and cultures to help influence and shape that. Otherwise, I feel we'll be in this sort of vicious cycle of not being able to change um, when you're working off a foundation of perhaps not the most diverse uh, leadership uh, organisation. So um, I, I look, look at it as in terms of what we can do um, to influence and to have our voices heard to start shaping that direction of travel, bearing in mind how long this does take so that we can create uh, a future that is continually getting better rather than resetting back into a sort of almost a deadlock. How do we break the cycle in this place? And I think in terms of COVID and the recent uh, pandemic and the challenge we have, I think we've got a really important role to play to prevent um, 
a, a, a panic or a, a quick, we must quickly act, we must do this, we haven't got time to be inclusive, we haven't got time to address uh, a, a diversity of thought, we must just get on and, and react. And I think we have to keep calling it out and keep for the long term, making sure that we are bringing in at every stage a breadth of uh, opinion view based on data and facts clearly, but just testing us every every day, every week, every conversation to drive the uh, agenda forward for a better future. Thank you. Now, now Lynn, um, you're, you're uh... Uh, a living embodiment of of of, um, of, of, of a, uh, demonstrating that uh, that the women have a role within a, a part of the industry where perhaps people assume that it's going to be male dominated in the scaffolding sector. Mm -hmm. um, do, do you think that diversity of, of thought at the at the highest levels is important within your sector of the industry? Most definitely. I think um, you've got to have a vast array of experiences within an organisation to progress foot forward and um, and diversity obviously is a is a very important role within that in that process. Um, the, um, the thoughts um, that we do as a board um, can range from a multiple different levels, um, which I didn't realise until I got involved with and to have so many different size companies and um, and people's experiences. I mean, I experienced something completely different to my male counterparts and um, it, it has helped. And sometimes you can nip things in the bud before they actually become an issue. So um, having that diversity within an organisation it, it is crucial. I do feel that. Um, and that's not like I said before, it's not just um, women itself. It's also a vast array of different um, diversity you need because um, especially with the NESC, um, it, you need to understand every sort of organisation, every sort of company within our membership. And if you don't understand that, then you don't understand the industry as a whole. And I do I do feel that I, I learnt as I went off and I fed off other presidents um, uh, how their companies were um, organized and run and then that's how I learnt and and I do think uh, yeah having a vast array of experience on a board makes a massive difference. Thank you. We're, we're going to turn to questions from our audience now. Um, the first one uh, I'd like to put um, uh, I, I think to Caroline. Um, uh, I think this is something that that, uh, that you mentioned to me uh, in pre preparation for the webinar. Um, the questioner is asking, the sector has made great strides in attracting younger females, but one area where I see firms struggling is how you attract younger black and minority ethnic females. Does the panel have any examples of what has worked well in their respective businesses to tackle this challenge? So, Caroline, do you have a, an observation? I mean, obviously with Black Lives Matter very much in the uh, forefront of thoughts at the moment, um, it's a, a really important topic, topic about how companies respond to this issue of uh, making sure that they appeal to uh, everyone regardless of ethnic background. What do you think? Yeah, um, and I would say um, it's uh, certainly following the Back uh, Lives Matter being in the forefront of the news and everybody's uh, mind. The, the, the reality of, of of the lengths that I've had to go to to bring this onto the agenda. I think I think for me, and you know, if I could if I could give you a really good example of where we've done it well and we've got great, we've got we've got this um, this really addressed, um, I can't. And for me, um, Black Lives Matter um, has really jolted everyone actually. Um, I, I personally feel that I've been woken up to something I um, probably haven't spent enough time recognising, seeing. We talk about uh, diversity and inclusion and fairness and sort of muddy on as if it's, it's it will get there in the end and it, it's happening and you know it's not that unfair. But I think all that I've learned certainly over the last um, couple of months is this sort of waking up to the extent of um, and I wouldn't necessarily say people people do this with real intent, 
but the reality is people haven't seen and felt what it is like to be um, a minority in this world. And um, I think the, the best thing is that we um, identify with that, uh, recognize that um, the, the extent of the problem that we have, the, the challenge it puts us in being able to create a diverse and inclusive environment, listen, um, be really curious about it, and be open to uh, the conversations. And then perhaps when we are far better informed and listening um, and bringing in uh, a diverse and inclusive conversation about it, perhaps then we could get some really meaningful campaign that really works, that's really appropriate, that lands at the right level, that talks in the right language to attract you know, a much wider, more diverse uh, population into our industry. Thank you. I don't know if would any of the other members of the panel like to um, make an observation about this question. Uh, uh, the questioner was particularly asking about things which have worked to to try and attract the interest of, of younger women from minority ethnic background. Let me try. I'll just make a, a quick comment about it. I think I think as somebody said earlier, it, you cannot start too early to uh, attract uh, people into the sector. The, the crucial point though is what is the sec how does the sector behave towards people who are not um, uh, from the traditional white male, you know, putting it brutally, that is the vast majority, uh, people who are not from that uh, of, of that ilk and um, that's the crucial point. The, the industry itself needs to put itself into the shoes of people coming in um, and there are many great role models of all ages and uh, and backgrounds in this sector. But we, I, I agree with Caroline, I think we all need to do more to put ourselves in the shoes of people and understand what it's like for them and go out of our way to make sure that people can build great careers in this sector. Otherwise, we're attracting people in and then letting them down. Thank you. Well, Sorry, we'll move yeah. on. To, uh, Lynn, Lynn, go yeah. ahead. Can I just add, I think we do need to um, begin this at grassroots level. Um, I know the NESC has been doing careers events with schools and things, and I do think if we can encourage from a very young age and to say this is the way to go, we can bring um, a lot more um, diverse people in, to be honest. Um, I think it, it, you, we, we do really need to push at grassroots level now. Mm. Indeed. Thank you. We'll, we'll move on to the next question now. There's a facility to give uh, thumbs up to questions that you see in the Q&A that other people have asked. So we're, we're going to put the, the one which has got the most thumbs up. Do you think it is harder to gain respect as a woman in a man dominated environment than it is for a man to gain respect? Would anybody like to uh, tackle that one? I'm happy to take that one, Lem. Um, okay, Karen, but... yes. Sorry, it's Helen. Oh, um, oh sorry, I, I, I apologise. It's okay. Um, my, my, my feeling is, is very similar to an earlier question around being yourself. I, I, I always feel that if you address a situation with knowledge and with credibility, there is absolutely no reason why you, you shouldn't be heard. Um, and it is about adapting your style to the environment that you find yourself in. Um, that there should be absolutely no reason whatsoever why a male view or opinion on something should be heard over and above yours. Um, e equally, it's it's important for us to consider um, the alternative opinion around the table as well. I think as, as, as leaders and as managers, it's really vital that you consider all the opinions around the table and, and actually openly um, agree if you feel that actually you maybe weren't correct to begin with. Um, I, I think you can gain quite a lot of respect through being very open and transparent with people. And Caroline, where, where are you trying to interject on this question of uh, of, of gaining respect? Yes. <laughs> yeah, um, I was just going to pick up on your point about um, 
whether um, you felt that you had to prove yourself more as as a as a female um, and experience that. I mean, I I I totally agree that you know in principle we should we should be in in a fair world where you know you're you're assessed uh, based on your capability and your output rather than who you are or what you look like. But I, I certainly, um, certainly in the early stages of my career, was, was certainly subjected to um, a need not to make a mistake um, and could see female colleagues around me who perhaps you know, had been landed in a situation where they weren't entirely comfortable. And um, as Lynn said earlier, landing into a construction site when you're fresh off uh, you know, college or university is quite a daunting thing and uh, to be surrounded by um, what is largely a male um, dominated environment is daunting. And I, I definitely could see that uh, it was my job not to make a mistake. And if I was going to be successful, it was about being better than everybody else. And I put the effort in, the, the hours in, you know, extra hours to make absolute sure I wasn't going to be the person to be a pitfall. And the response at that time when you made a mistake was not the help and the support and the understanding uh, that perhaps you need, as any new engineer would need. Um, it was actually right, you better get out of, of the site environment and get back into the office. So and I, I, I wonder how much of that still exists and sort of flipping it then on to what we can do about it and, and a call to everybody. Um, you know, whatever your characteristics is to be um, looking out for this and checking in with your team, as I say, whatever their characteristics, to check that they are being supported and they have got a fair, fair chance. Um, because um, whether we like it or not, uh, discrimination exists and we need to we need to be tackling it and we can't just tackle it by having a strong group of, of females, everybody needs to, to get involved on this. Uh, we are drawing to the end of our allotted time. I'm going to try and squeeze in one more question. Uh, Gillian, perhaps you can uh, give your opinion. Uh, is there a, a risk that uh, if women make a, a big point about the, um, the the issue of diversity of thought at the, at the, at the senior levels in their audience, if they are pushing the, uh, the idea that the organisation should be uh, more taking greater action to to encourage women uh, into their business that, that that might have an alienating impact on the men in the organization it may do more harm than good uh, if people are very vocal about the underrepresentation of women in the industry what, what, what do you think Gillian? well I, I i would go back to to what i said earlier about the the business case because i think if 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 we're still at the stage of talking about diversity as, a, as an issue of equality and fairness, which it all absolutely is and should be, but we don't seem to have made the progress we ought to have made by framing the debate in that way. Let's move it on to, to the business imperative of having greater diversity of thought um, around the board table and get away from um, external characteristics or, or background um, and, and actually start focusing on what individuals are contributing. Um, I certainly have throughout my career have never never made anything of the, the fact that I'm female. It just hasn't been something I've I've really felt the need to to introduce into the conversation. Um, obviously, some people, uh, some women do feel the need to make that point. But I think I think it's about you know being um, being businesslike, knowing what absolutely knowing what you're talking about, making your contribution, going out of your way to make a constructive contribution, and just just demonstrating through your actions and your contribution um, that your different perspective um, will will make a valuable contribution. So I think it's very much about walking you know walking the walk really rather than uh, talking the talk for me personally that's that's how i've really tended to operate thank you now as i say we, we are drawing to the uh, end of the time that we have uh, allotted 
I'd like to ask each of you just to, if you could um, provide a, perhaps a parting thought to our um, uh, our audience about um, uh, what you've learned today or, or what you think that they should have front of mind um, tackling uh, this issue in their own careers as they go forward. Uh, Lynn, perhaps would you like to say your parting thoughts? Yes, um, it's been very interesting. Um, it's good to hear different points of view um, within the industry itself. I do think we have got a lot more work to do um, moving on. Um, but I'm I'm hopeful that we are going to, uh, we're definitely moving in the right direction now. Um, and none of us wants to go back to the old ways. So in regards to women in general within construction, uh, what I said earlier, I would say be yourself. Don't be scared to put yourself forward because I know it's confidence is a lot of it. And um, also I would um, just do your best. I mean, I think half of it is you do overthink sometimes and you're thinking somebody's thinking this and they're, they're really not. And um, and also <laughs> I've noticed a lot of ma uh, males actually are over nice and try not to offend me where I just want to be walking in a room and be treated as one. You know, I don't want to be looked at as a woman. I just want to be looked at as a, a person that is doing my job. So and I, I think that is the way we want to move forward. Thank you. Thanks, Lynn. Um, Helen, your final thoughts? Um, I very much embrace everything Lynn's just said. Um, for me, um, it is be you. Be the best you can, be open and fair and considers, consider how others feel through your own actions. Thank you. Gillian, uh, your final thoughts? Yes, I, I think um, the, the themes have been really good this morning. I, I would just encourage people, um, not just women, but anybody who is looking to forge a, a career and make progress in the industry to make sure that you're getting the right support, um, make sure that you've got those mentors lined up, that you are tapping into people you see as role models uh, and networks. And I've seen some fantastic networks in the industry where people are really supporting each other to build their confidence and build their strength uh, in terms of career. Um, I do mentor a number of people in the industry and uh, I, I wouldn't be able to accept a flood of uh, uh, requests but if anybody listening to the call is keen to uh, to have some mentoring uh, I'm I'm open to uh, a couple of more people so I would like to put my money where my mouth is on that one this morning uh, very happy to share my my journey with uh, with a couple of new mentees well thank you a very generous offer there Gillian we do have several hundred people watching so uh, look out uh, <laughs> and I, I would like to also add um, that uh, that our previous uh, webinar in this series uh, focused on the issue of mentoring and uh, if anybody watching is interested in that they can go to constructionnews.co.uk and search for mentoring and it should be the, the first thing that pops up. Um, uh, there's a recording that you can watch of that previous uh, webinar. Uh, and finally Caroline if you'd like to uh, offer your parting thoughts. Yes thanks um, and really reiterate what's already been said actually. Um, I think I think there's real value in being yourself, um, acting with integrity and true to your values. As we discussed earlier, it's, it's incredibly hard work trying to be somebody else. Um, generally, I think we need to be really courageous and the wider we, this isn't just for the women in the industry, but this is for everyone to be really courageous to raise issues in the moment as when you see um, something that you feel um, perhaps hasn't uh, either landed in the way that it should or um, has been interpreted in the way that it should or feels unfair. And I'd also, in, in the, to, to support that as well, is encourage everyone to be as curious about it as possible. Curious as to what other people are thinking, how other, why people are behaving in the way they are. And certainly as leaders, it's a really key attribute um, to explore that further because quite often people will just not have realised, not been aware and um, you know actually nothing 
I think like a good conversation uh, to be able to explore that further and perhaps inspire um, people to think differently. Well, thank you very much, Caroline. And uh, I'd like to thank all of our panelists today, Caroline, Gillian, Helen and Lynn for sharing their thoughts and their experiences uh, so generously today. Um, I'd like to thank as well our sponsors, uh, as I mentioned at the start, uh, Wilmot Dixon, uh, Juice Marketing, uh, NASC, Trad and uh, Banshee Construction. Um, the next event in our Inspiring Women programme is scheduled for the autumn, uh, so do keep an eye out at constructionnews.co.uk for further updates. We'll, we'll be having uh, details of our next event very soon. Um, finally, uh, a big thank you to everyone who's taken the time today to watch. Uh, I hope you found today's webinar helpful, useful, interesting. I, I certainly have found it interesting myself. So from all of us today, uh, goodbye. Thanks for watching and stay safe. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.